No, it's it's really really great to be with all of you. Um, I, you know, some of you were still kind of gone last week from spring break and that, so it's still, there's, there's several people here that I'm seeing for the first time in several weeks because of everything that's been going on in our world. So um, I'm just excited to be back here. I'm excited to be able to share from God's Word with you this morning. We are beginning uh, a two-week series, just a short little series called uh, The Hidden Option this morning. And I want to start off by asking you a question how many of you in here are avid readers? Who loves to read books in here? Um, who, okay, who, who absolutely hates reading um, and actually, you know, is super thankful for audiobooks, you know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Or, or you know, if it's not made into a movie, then I don't know the story. Yeah, right? So I, um, I... I enjoy reading. I don't know that I would call myself an avid reader. In fact, it's, it's been probably a while since I've read a book just for leisure. Um, I, I've read, I, I, these days I feel like I read a lot of things that are like ministry oriented or leadership books and that. And I have, you know, if I'm reading anything for fun, I'm reading, I'm reading comic books. Um, and, and I will tell you that, that as a kid, that was the, that was the thing. I, didn't start off enjoying reading that much, and my, my parents had to kind of like push on that a little bit, because the only things that I really wanted to read were comic books or fantasy sci-fi, uh, and then there was this other type of book that you may remember. They, I think they still make these now today, because everything's kind of come back around, but does anybody remember Choose Your Own Adventure books? You remember Choose Your Own Adventure books? Okay, so if you don't know what a Choose Your Own Adventure book is, this is what's great about it. Most stories, the author has already set the narrative in place, right? It has a beginning, it has an end, and, and you're just kind of, as the reader, you're along for the ride. You don't really do anything that impacts the story because the story's already been, been written, so you, you're just going through it. Whereas in a choose-your-own-adventure book, there are choices along the way that you get to make that affect the ending of the story, and, and I, I loved that. In fact, they would advertise on the books like 40 different possible endings, you know, and that, which meant that not only could you just read through it once, but then you could go back and read it again and make other choices and get another ending. And, and I just really enjoyed that. I, I also, I mean, it, I, you know, I, I like video games or I, I used to play a lot more, but when I, when I was younger, those were the type of games that I liked to play were things where I got to make choices that impacted the end of the story. I like options. And as we live life, we're constantly faced with situations that require us to think, require us to make decisions, and then require us to act upon those choices that we make. And making this process even more difficult for us is the fact that we live in a world that is very polarized. Would you not agree with that? We live in a culture that is very polarized. Oftentimes, we simplify our problems down to two possible solutions, and then we pick one, like door number one, door number two, A or B, black or white, right or wrong, good or evil, left or right, and, and we pick one of those because people are trained to see most problems as having two solutions. In fact, uh, some biologists say that two-solution idea, that two-solution idea is ingrained into every creature, and, uh, and that is often referred to as a fight-or-flight mentality. Fight-or-flight response is also known as uh, an acute stress response. It refers to a physio physiological reaction that occurs in the presence of something that is, e that is very terrifying, either uh, physically or mentally. And the response is triggered by the release of hormones that prepare your body to either stay and deal with the threat or to run away and find safety. So in, uh, in his book, The Hidden Option, author Jonathan Malm, he explains the concept of fight or flight, and he says that when confronted with a survival emergency, people default to one of these two responses. Either they run away or they stand their ground and fight. And while this 
while this is a great survival instinct, unfortunately, many of us then carry that same fight or flight response into more complicated problems that we encounter into, in, in our lives. So when we face stressful problems, many of us tend towards a fight or flight response to a, 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 a two option mentality. And what that does is it, it can often lead us to a reactionary mode where um, when we're under pressure, when we're under stress, we react. And we can make some bad choices because of that. Because when we feel trapped, when we feel hopeless, when we feel like we're between a rock and a hard place, backed into a corner, sometimes that, is our, that becomes our default mechanism, is that fight or flight. What we're going to talk about this morning is what if we were able to take a step back from our problems and view them from a different perspective? What if there was another option other than the two? What if there was another option that we just were unable to see right now? What if there's a hidden option or hidden options to the complex problems that we face in our lives? So today we're beginning this two-part series called The Hidden Option. We're going to explore God's creative solutions to some of life's most impossible problems. And we're gonna begin our conversation today by looking at a story where Jesus found himself in what appeared to be a a pretty impossible situation. So in this story, Jesus is reported to be at the temple and a crowd forms around him, which often happened when Jesus came onto the scene. So he begins to teach the people. and, And while he's teaching them, The scribes and Pharisees appear before him, and they bring along with them a woman who is caught in the act of adultery. So this story comes from the book of John chapter 8. So if you have a Bible or Bible app, um, or just eyes to look at the screen, you can do any or all of those things. Uh, John chapter 8, we're going to look together at verses 2 through 6 to begin with, and, and see how Jesus handles what looks to be Uh, no-win situation. Here's what it says. At dawn, he went to the temple again, and all the people were coming to him. He sat down. He began to teach them. Then the scribes and Pharisees brought a woman caught in adultery, making her stand in the center. Teacher, they said to him, this woman was caught in the act of committing adultery. In the law, Moses commanded us to stone such women. So what do you say? And they asked him this to trap him so that they might have evidence to accuse him. Jesus stooped down and started to write on the ground with his finger. So as Jesus is teaching, the scribes and the Pharisees are up to no good. They bring this woman, they drag this woman out into the public you know, area uh, where, the, you know, where he's teaching at the temple put her right in the middle of all the people and say, this woman was caught in the act of adultery. And that phrase, caught in the act, it actually means that uh, this is an undeniable act. She was, she was caught. They're not, they're not bringing this woman to Jesus because uh, she needs to be put on trial. They're not looking to dispute her innocence here. Somebody caught her. We don't know who caught her. We don't know how that went down. But we do know this, that the religious leaders, their, their anger in this moment is disingenuous because they don't really care about her. We read in verse 6, it tells us that these men were there to trap Jesus more than they were to be concerned with this woman. These leaders thought that they could trap Jesus because their way of thinking was linear. They thought there's only two possible solutions to this. And neither of them are going to go well for Jesus in this. They thought they had him. The first option was for Jesus to suggest that they execute the woman by stoning her. And this was the solution that most people believed that God's law demanded in situations like this. Unfortunately, this would make Jesus the executioner. And that sentence would seem to contradict a lot of his recent teachings to his followers about love and forgiveness. And then there's this implied second option, 
which was that Jesus would say to her, well, she, she shouldn't have to pay the, the penalty first. And we're going to let her off the hook. She's not going to have any consequences. Um, I absolve her. And, and that would put Jesus in an opposition to the law of God itself. So these are the two options, and neither of these are good for Jesus. So the religious leaders are sure that they have him trapped. Choose, take choice A, and then Jesus undermines his own teaching. Take choice B, and now you have violated and put yourself in opposition to the law of Moses. Again, the accusers here, they're not seeking to debate the woman's guilt or innocence. There's, no one is questioning her guilt. What they are attempting to do in this moment is to thrust Jesus into a role of the sentencing judge. They want, to, they want him to make one of these two choices in that and, uh, and to pay the, 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 the consequences for it. Speaking of two choices, did you know that everything that you see on your computer, everything that you do on your, on your phone, all of that comes down to just two numbers, right? This two-number system is called binary, right? It's, it's how computers think. Computers process, and they talk in a language of, of ones and zeros. And by processing a series of ones and zeros, it means uh, that then from processing that, they know where the computer knows. They know. They know. Um, your computer knows. I don't know. They're becoming aware. Um, your computer knows where your mouse is. It knows what text it should put on the screen and, and what colors to show. So here's, in fact, what Canvas Church looks like in binary language. Um, it's exciting. Uh, yeah, I, I figured that you guys would, yeah, yeah, take a minute and process that. Okay. It's just ones and zeros, right? And that's how computers communicate. That's how they work. That's how machines operate. But we aren't machines. You are not bound by just two options. You weren't created to just be a processor of one, ones and zeros. In fact, the Bible says that we are fearfully and wonderfully made. So you can know that there's another option out there if we're willing to really have open eyes to look for it. Imagine being in a position like Jesus is in. We, I, I think probably all of us across this room have been in places where we felt trapped. You are in what looks to be an impossible situation. It does not look like there are any good options. Both option A and B are not good. What do you do? When we're confronted with, with compli complicated, complex problems, it's easy for us to fall into a trap of thinking that we only have bad options. There's no other way. It's where we get the phrase a lot of times and think to ourselves, uh, well, I guess in a situation like this, I'm going to have to choose the lesser of two evils. You've heard that phrase, right? And that happens a lot of times when we feel like we're in a place where we're stuck but what if the same creative, hidden options that were available to, G to Jesus are also available to us? Because they are. They are. They're available to us through the power of the Holy Spirit that lives with inside those who, who follow Christ. So what, what will Jesus do? What did Jesus do in this situation? How will he get out of this tough spot? Well, let's continue on in verses 7 through 9 of our story. It says, When they kept on questioning him, he straightened up and he said to him, said to them, Let any one of you who is without sin be the first to throw a stone at her. Again, he stooped down and he wrote on the ground. We're, we're not sure what he wrote. No one knows exactly. Some people speculate that what Jesus was doing when he was writing in the dirt was he was, he was writing out, the, the, he was pointing out the sins of those who were around him, the accusers. We don't know. But whatever it was, 
it shook them to their core. And they took a step back and looked at it. And then we read in verse 9, at this response, those who heard began to go away one at a time. The older ones first until only Jesus was left with the woman still standing there. Just a shout out to the older ones in our group too. Um, I noticed that I was like, oh, it made it specifically stated the older ones first. More wisdom there. Anyway, um, <laughs> I said that to Kim because she has she's, it's her birthday today. So anyway, um, <clears throat> here's the thing: some hidden options can only be discovered through God. They can only be discovered through God. In fact, if you claim to be a follower of Christ, you have discovered the best hidden option there is, and that is salvation. Because before Jesus came along, we only had two options available to us. Option one was to obey the law perfectly. What was the law? That was to follow the Ten Commandments as well as the rules, the other rules of the Old Testament that are laid out. To do that not just once, but to do that every day and to do it absolutely perfectly every moment of your life so that you could have life. Option two, if you were to disobey, if you were to step outside of the law, to be separated from God for eternity. Those were the two options. And the reality of the, is this, we have all tried option one. We have all tried in our own strength to reconcile ourselves back to God, to do the right thing. And yet, the Bible tells us that all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. All of us, all of us have failed in that process to try to just keep the rules. We don't have it in ourselves to do that. And so then because of that, we have option two, which the Bible also tells us then that because of sin, the wages of sin, the penalty of sin is death. But then Jesus comes along and he offers a hidden option. And that option was revealed back actually in Genesis, but humanity for the most part Miss the revelation that Jesus, that God loved us enough and he knew that we could not, we could not bring healing to the relationship that was severed by sin on our own. We would need another way. And so he sent Jesus Christ and it was through his death and his resurrection, through his conquering of sin and death that we experience life no longer did we have to obey the law perfectly? We couldn't do it anyways. And no longer do we have to die separated from God. Jesus fulfilled the law for us. And his righteousness now applies to all of our lives. The religious leaders thought they had Jesus backed into a corner. And I mean, if, if you were in the same situation what would you have done, especially if you didn't know the end of the story, if you didn't know how Jesus handled it? Would you look at the situation and would you assess it and are, are you the type of person that would say, hey, right is right and wrong is wrong. She broke the law. There's consequences for that. She must pay the price. So we stone her. Would that be you? Or would you say, uh... Everyone makes mistakes, and therefore she should be let off the hook and then disrespect the law. It's great drama. I mean, you have to admit that. It's great drama. And yet it's interesting because as all the drama is happening, what does Jesus do? He kneels down, and he begins to write in the dirt. Jesus offers up an ingenious way to deal with the leaders. What an answer. The one without sin among you should be the first to throw a stone at her. There's no way in the world, no way they saw that coming. 
these were smart people. They had thought through this. They thought there was no loophole. They had him. There's no way that they could have expected Jesus to respond the way that he did. And so, again, we read the response that they have in verse 9. When they heard this, they left one by one, and the older ones first, until only Jesus was left with the woman still standing there. How many situations in our lives are, that we're faced with where it looks like that no matter what we do, what, no matter what option we choose, it's not going to turn out well. When we get to that point, we tend to hunker down. We tend to rely upon our own strength, our own wisdom, our own ingenuity. We either, we either spend our energy trying to figure it out or we flee. It's like it's the fight or flight thing. It's, it's rough when you feel like you're caught between a rock and a hard place. I don't know if you guys remember a movie that came out. I don't remember how many years ago it's been. But there's a movie that's called uh, The Martian, and it was based on a, a very popular book the same title, about a man that's stranded on the surface of Mars. And it's a brilliant story, really, about problem solving. Um, Mark Watney is the main character in the movie and in the book. And in the movie, he's played by Matt Damon. Um, Damon. Um, <laughs> and he's constantly faced with these life and death situations where he's got to use science and creative problem solving to survive. And some of his ideas work out really well for him. And if you remember the movie, some of them not so well. Let's take a look at that real quick. You know, I, I love that scene because it's just a great depiction of what sometimes happens to us in our lives when we're doing things on our own effort in that, in our own strength. They blow up in our face, right? Um, but in this story, the character uses his ingenuity. He's able to survive on Mars by growing four years of, uh, of potatoes inside his habitat, using chemistry to extract water from rocket fuel, and harnessing a plutonium battery to provide him heat um, in the deadly cold of Mars. But ultimately, in this story, his efforts only get him so far. And he must rely upon outside help if he's going to survive, if he's going to make it off of the surface of Mars. And the same holds true for us. We can only go so far in our own strength. We can only go so far with our own abilities, with our own skill sets. Yes, you were given a mind. Yes, we think we're smart. Yes, we think we're invincible sometimes in that. All those things are true to a point. But sometimes when we're dealing with and we're backed up against the wall with our problems in that, and we're looking at them, our own efforts just fall short. Our energy blows up, our, our activity ends up blowing up in our face. Ultimately, we cannot save ourselves. We are in need of a Savior, every single one of us. And God knew that from the beginning. And he intervened and he sent his son, Jesus Christ, to be that redeemer, to be that redemption for us, to, to finally do what we could not do ourselves, to bridge that gap between us and God, and to heal and restore that relationship. Romans chapter 5, verse 10 says, For if while we were God's enemies, we were reconciled to him through the death of his son, how much more, having been reconciled, shall we be saved through his life? Salvation. 
was the first and most important of God's provisions to us. It's the thing that freed us from the penalty of sin that gave us life. But the the great news is, is that in this life that we live, we do face problems. And even in those situations, we are not left alone. God provides for us options when we need them. But we have to learn to look to him, not look to just our own strength, but to lean upon God, to trust God. When Jesus ascended into heaven and to to be seated at the right hand of God the Father, he said, I'm not leaving this earth, leaving you alone, but I am sending a companion. I am sending a helper. I'm sending my Holy Spirit. That spirit dwells within the life of the believer. And that spirit gives us uh, discernment. That spirit gives us power. That spirit gives us creativity. When again, we're looking at things and we're like, I'm stuck. It helps us to be able to see what we're unable to see ourselves. When we look to God, in life, we will be able to see the hidden option. Let's look at verses 10 and 11 for this final thought. When Jesus stood up, he said to her, woman, where are they? Has no one condemned you? No one, Lord, she answered. Well, neither do I condemn you, said Jesus. Go, and from now on, do not sin anymore. You see, finding the hidden option is not something that just offers hope to us in our lives, but it can also bring hope to others. When Jesus escaped the trap with this woman that was caught in adultery, he provided more than just hope for himself, but he provided hope for her. Because if she was in a helpless situation, she was completely trapped, she was guilty, and the consequences of her sin were death. If Jesus hadn't escaped that trap set for him, she would have died. When we seek the hidden options, when we lean into the power of the Holy Spirit, those options serve not to only be a blessing to us, but to be a blessing to those around us. For the person who's struggling with sin that they can't find their way out of, they've tried and they've tried and they've tried to will themselves out of it. And they continue to fail. They feel defeated. Taking the hidden option of hope through Jesus will not only bless you, but all those around you, your friends, and most of all, your family. When I look back on my own life, I am so grateful that God revealed himself to me in a personal way. That I realized that I'm not good enough, and but yet only through the grace of God have I been saved from my mistakes, from my failures, that there's a God who loves me, and he sent his son to be broken and die on my behalf, but that Savior conquered death once and for all, and I have been lavished with his love and his grace and his mercy been given life and life abundantly. I'm so thankful that God revealed that to my heart and that I made that decision long ago to choose that hidden option of salvation and to receive the life that he has offered to me. You know, this... um, these last several weeks have been, you know, very difficult. We talked about this a little. I talked about this a little bit last week with what's going on with my dad and that. Um, and it's interesting because I have, I have walked beside a lot of individuals and families at, in my role as a chaplain who have walked through end of life, um, you know, issues and, and challenges and that. And it's so different when you're going through it yourself. It really, really is. And uh, back when we were still at the hospital before we had transferred my dad to hospice, I remember 
that we were talking with him at different points, and, and it became clear to me that my dad viewed things in this two-option mentality. I either, I, I, I either have, to, I, I have to find the strength to muster up, to, to continue to fight this disease, or I, I get shifted over into a nursing home and, 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 and I, I basically rot there. That's I, kind of what his communication was. There, was. there was fear there that that would be an option that would be taken. And so we had to discuss at all, all differing points the difference between, you know, we talk a lot about in life about living well. But one of the things that I have talked a lot with families about and now I've been able to discuss and, and, and kind of try to take my dad through too is what it looks like to die well. We don't have those kinds of discussions. We don't like to talk about death. We only like to talk about life. Even though death is like, what's the old phrase? Like the only... The only two absolutes, no, it's not, something like that. Death and taxes, right? Something like that about death and taxes. Those are the things that we can count on no matter what. Death is going to happen for each and every one of us. And yet we don't like to talk about it. And I don't know that, that a lot of us even have a concept for what it looks like to die well. That that can look differently. And so... You know, I, it was, it's, it's, it's not easy to have those discussions with your loved ones. It's not easy to take them through that process. But I, I do believe, and I've seen a difference in my dad's heart and his countenance as he began to understand what it looks like to, uh, to begin to regain quality of life. You know, because every day that we have on this planet is a gift. We hear that all the time. I think we're cognizant of that. But, you know, I've never seen it as much as I've seen it in these last few weeks um, firsthand to be able to go, wow. You know, because day to day, we haven't known what we're going to experience when we walk in and see my dad. Some days are not so good. And other days, you walk in expecting one thing, and then all of a sudden, he's feeling better than he's felt in years. Good days, bad days, each day is a gift, no matter what, that life that's given. And so um, I've been walking out this hidden option thing with my own family of saying, hey, I don't think there's just two ways to look at this. But I think God has provided other options, other pathways a different perspective. Let's step back from this situation and let's look at it, you know, uh, from a different angle. What does it look like to live out life, whatever that, however long that is, with the highest level of quality, which means that you're at peace with God, you're at peace with those around you, you spend time with those that you love and value, you don't leave things unsaid, but you say what needs to be, and then you enjoy the moment and the blessing and the gift that you've been given while you've been given it. My dad has awareness of that, I think, in ways that we all should be living in. But anytime I talk to somebody who's kind of either, you know, at times people who are battling cancer are given a diagnosis where they're told, you've got days, you've got weeks. And while we look at that in a very tragic way, oh my goodness, I can't even imagine. I'll tell you what, all of the rest of us, we don't know. You know, like we really don't know what kind of time we have. People that are told they have days or weeks, they live life differently. Probably in ways that we should be, not probably, definitely in ways that the rest of us should all be spending each and every moment of our lives. There's even gift in that. So when God gives us hidden options, it's, it's not always just for us. Yes, God will sometimes help us out of sticky situations by giving us his creativity, but he also uses those situations to impact those around us. 
Our opportunity as disciples of Jesus, as followers of Christ, is to help others find God's justice and grace for their own lives. Ultimately, the most significant hidden option that we can bring, that we can bring people into is a relationship with a God who loves them. A God who loves them, a God that wants what's best for them and has offered to them a relationship through his son, Jesus Christ. We must lead them to the source of those options of grace and mercy and healing and reconciliation. The great news for you today, no matter what problems you're facing, is the same power, the same creativity available to Jesus in this story that we've talked about this morning is available to you. You don't have to feel trapped in the circumstances that you're facing. You don't need to feel that way. God is there. He wants you to know that in the midst of your circumstances that he has not left you alone. But you've got to reach out to him. You've got to reach towards him. The God of all the universe who created you has given you creativity. And that creativity and that discernment and that ingenuity comes out in its fullest when we lean upon the guidance of the Holy Spirit at work in our lives. When we start to see and to look for God's hidden option in our lives, we see hope again. And not only that, but people around us will also begin to experience hope. Those options, again, are not just for us, but they're for those around us. So as I pray this morning and as we close, I'm going to invite the worship team to come back and to, to lead us in a closing song. Again, as, as Kim talked about earlier this morning, there is a lot of us in here who are facing very difficult decisions, very difficult circumstances in their lives. Some of those things have raised fear. They've raised anxiety. Maybe there are things that we have uh, made effort to try to figure out on our own, and our efforts have have simply just not gotten the job done. We, we keep hitting our heads against the wall or it keeps blowing up in our face. Some of us in here have felt trapped or feel trapped, feel cornered. My prayer for you today is that you recognize that you are not left alone, but there is one to help and to guide in this process. Maybe what he desires for you today is to take a step back because sometimes with our problems, we are so close to it. We're so pressed into it that we cannot even see clearly what is happening. And God wants us to simply take a step back and he offers us a different perspective. One that comes through his eye of sight and not ours. And so my prayer for you today is that you would lean in to a God that is all sufficient, that knows your heart inside and out, that any tear you've ever shed has not gone unnoticed by him. He cares about the things that weigh heavy upon you. And he does not want you to leave this place in fear. He doesn't want you to leave this place in a feeling where you, your only options are to fight or just to escape. God wants to empower you this morning to realize that there's another option. So my prayer is that you would reach out and take his hand and that he would be able to speak the words of wisdom and words of life into you today. That you're not alone. His presence is here with us. So let's pray. God, thank you so much. God, thank you for your grace and mercy that is poured out upon us. Lord, I, I thank you for your word. 
I thank you, God, that this message, is, it's, it's not about whether or not there is such a thing as good or evil or black and white. There certainly is. But sometimes, God, we get ourselves into situations where we think in our minds that we're left with no options. We think in our minds that there is no good path that we can take and we feel stuck, we feel trapped, we feel suffocated. Our problems have become so big and our God has become so small. God, I pray that you would help us today to lean into you, to trust you, to hear your voice that speaks to us in the midst of our fear, in the midst of our anxiety. Help us to see that there are other options at our disposal, that we would have your eyes to see the things that are happening around us, that we would be able to take a step back and we would not feel like we have to fight or flee but God, we would feel empowered and confident, not because of our own efforts, but because of your spirit that lives and dwells within us. Oh, thank you, God, that you provided us the greatest hidden option of all, that when we were lost in our sin, that you provided salvation. You provided your son, Jesus Christ. We are humbled by that. We are in awe of that. We celebrate that today. Thank you, God, that you have rescued us. We love you. In Jesus' name.